Good morning. Welcome to the Planning Director's Roundtable hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, my name is Chuck Boyd and I am the Director of Planning Coordination at the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, this is our third uh, um, viral um, Planning Director's Roundtable and uh, we, we sometimes uh, have things work perfectly and sometimes we don't so forgive us uh, when we have a, a glitch here and there uh, we've had 80 people attend uh, the last two viral um, uh, sessions that we had um, or uh, virtual I should say virtual it's our viral COVID here but virtual um, um, PDR meetings the last two uh, last year we had two sessions uh, and we have about registered almost 90 this time. So uh, I'm hoping uh, we're, we're creeping up in our attendance. Uh, if you notice in the control panel uh, on the right hand side, you can see who people are attending. And uh, um, so make sure uh, you take a look and see if your uh, uh, neighbor is participating or not. And uh, you can uh, talk uh, uh, wonderful this plan director's roundtable was uh, afterwards. So. Uh, hopefully, with this pandemic winding down, that we will no longer need to have uh, these video conferences yet. Um, uh, I, I'm hoping that we can retain some of the benefits of these video conferences, particularly for those that are uh, uh, you know, more remote and not able to easily travel to a central location. So, uh, again, we welcome any suggestion you have. To, Improving the quality of these plan direct roundtable meetings. And again, I want to thank you for your participation today. So we have uh, the Department of Planning has continued to, to partner with EPA and the Smart Growth Network. Uh, hopefully, many of you participated in uh, previous uh, uh, webinars that we have uh, sponsored, and I want to encourage you to consider two upcoming ones. One of them, in fact, is today. Uh, what is the, a walkability study, and why should I do one? Um, it's later on today at two o'clock. Uh, another one, which is partnering with EPA, uh, I'm sorry, APA, APA, um, on, on equity and policy and practice addressing past inequities in planning for the future. That's tomorrow. April 30th at 1 p.m. Uh, and uh, if you visited APA's website, they have uh, prepared a, uh, a policy guide on uh, on equity issues, and we were able to get the uh, authors of that report to uh, um, participate in that webinar. So uh, please consider attending that one. If you do want to attend, uh, you can register for these webinars at smartgrowth.org. Um, you, if you go to smartgrowth.org, you click on the, the, the title of the webinar and you will just go through that registration process. Um, and okay, of course, we're going to continue to, to do uh, future webs, uh, webinars throughout the year. And I, again, I hope you uh, participate and we welcome any suggestions along the way. So, Obviously, uh, we're going to record today's uh, webinar for purposes of, of uh, sharing it with others, or uh, we'll post it on uh, the planning director's webpage, um, and you can always refer back to it. In addition to uh, the uh, webinar uh, video, uh, we post a variety of studies, reports, um, including an archive of all of the, the presentations from the uh, the, the roundtable that we'll have today. So go, please go to that uh, website on uh, Maryland Department of Planning's uh, website to uh, get uh, and download any of the, the PowerPoints that you find interesting or of interest. Um, I will also note that um, on the control panel, uh, you might look at the bottom, there are three handouts that we've listed, including the agenda. Uh, there is a PowerPoint up. Uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation for the updates. We intend to get to all of this today, but if we don't get to anything uh, specifically, uh, you can get contact information uh, and uh, follow up on any of those particular updates. Uh, 
or there's also a um, uh, a download of the uh, building permit software survey report that the Department of Planning has prepared. So if you're interested and did not receive that, feel free to uh, look at that. So I just uh, this is probably old hat for most of you, and you've probably gone through this process before. Uh, but this is our uh, tutorial on the the actual webinar uh, uh, control panel, where the start where the arrow is for you to move it aside if you want to move it aside. Uh, we won't be using the hand oh, uh, raising the hand, so we're not going to be uh, using that portion. But uh, I do want to encourage you throughout the presentations to uh, write down in there, type type in your your questions. Uh, send them to us throughout the process, and I will uh, moderate a, re a, a uh, opportunity to review those um, whenever we actually have a chance to to uh, close out this particular session. Uh, one of the first things we want to do is we want to find out uh, where folks are uh, in the state. So uh, at this point, would you please, uh, uh, John, uh, show the poll? And uh, are you in the capital? Central Maryland? Uh, are you in the eastern shore, upper re or lower eastern shore? Are you on uh, in in southern Maryland or, or western Maryland? We want to know who where you're at so that we can uh, get a flavor of what, who who's participating and hopefully uh, you can uh, see uh, your compatriots and your your fellow planners are. I'll just give you a few more seconds to uh, go through that. And I'll let uh, John close that out when he thinks it's uh, a pretty uh, complete uh, response. And we have, um, see, looks like we got the Eastern Shore well represented and Central Maryland is, is uh, Got 43 percent. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the numbers here as best as I could here. Hold on a second here. Um, 43 percent for Central Maryland, uh, 28 percent for Eastern Shore, uh, 15 percent for Southern Maryland. Uh, Western Maryland's got eight, and the capital region seven. So again, thank you so much for participating in that. Uh, survey. Now we know who, where everyone is, and uh, that'll give us a good sense for that. So, at this point, I wanted to uh, uh, go over uh, who our speakers are, will be for today. And um, Sean Kilbert, uh, Gip, I'm sorry, Sean Kimberly is the uh, senior transportation planner with the Maryland of uh, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. Um, Sean oversees BMC's building permit data reporting system. And over the past 10 deca ten, two decades, um, BMC has been, been comp compiling regions building permit information into a standardized database and utilizing that data for transportation planning, economic development, and for other regional development monitoring efforts. Uh, so he will be going over that. We also have uh, uh, two new climate change mapping tools. So uh, Dave Gwinnett of the uh, state uh, NFIP coordinator from the Maryland Department of the Environment um, has led an effort for the, with uh, the Maryland Environmental Services to uh, develop a coast, coastal smart climate ready action plan boundary, map, action boundary, CRAB map, that serves as a resource tool to identify and mitigate future Flood risks and states existing uh, of, of the state's existing and planned infrastructure. Meredith Hill, Chief of Innovative Planning and Performance Division at M.SHA, and, and Jessica Scherer, who's a consultant for M.SHA, will go over M.SHA's new climate change vulnerability app that showcases geospatial data related to climate change and the potential impact. Uh, to, to the state of Maryland's transportation infrastructure. Then finally, Christy uh, fleshman Kronke, uh, manager of strategic programs at MPGE, will discuss the challenges that 
utility, uh, public utilities are facing, promoting the electrical vehicle charging um, in multi-family uh, communities. And the uh, incentive program that BGE offers to encourage multifamily property owners to install EV charging stations. In addition to these main speakers, uh, we're going to get some state agency program updates. Uh, Andrew Mangle of the Department of Natural Resources will brief us on the uh, LPPRP. Um, uh, Al Sandera, manager of the State Data Center, is going to brief us on uh, the state, uh, the 2020 uh, census, uh, some of those upcoming releases and information related to the census. Deborah Sward, uh, Assistant Manager of uh, Planning's uh, Geospatial Section, will uh, uh, brief us on the, the statewide land use mapping uh, update effort. Shelly April, uh, Planner with the uh, Planning's Geospatial Data, Data Analysis Group, is going to uh, give us an update on the generalized zoning project that we've been working on. And then finally, Joe Griffiths, Manager of the Planning's Local Assistance and Training Section, will brief us on the housing element uh, that they've been working on the online website. So at this particular point, uh, looks like Secretary McCord has not been able to join us just yet. Um, I was hoping to have him talk to us and we're gonna get back to him uh, when he is, he has a meeting, uh, IAC meeting. So uh, I'm going to move forward to our first discussion, um, and then we will get back to Secretary McCord when he is able to to be on the line. So uh, at this point, I want to kind of change to um, the discussion of the the building permit uh, data, and and Sean will be on here a second in a moment, but I wanted to, to briefly go over the hit the highlights of the um, building permit data system, uh, building permit software survey that we conducted. Uh, we sent a draft report out uh, recently to those participated and basically really every local government and that was no easy uh, challenge to, to uh, get uh, folks to uh, participate, but I really appreciate those that did. Um, and uh, we've sent out the report. And we've heard back from some folks that have given some clarification information. We've also received a variety of folks that have actually used the information and looked up it. So we really appreciate it and, and encourage you to read that report um, and uh, to, uh, to, to let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. But I wanted to, to, to kind of put this in context while we're talking about building the permit software uh, survey, as well as building permits in general. Uh, if you recall uh, from our last planning director's roundtable, we had a um, presentation on rethinking uh, the growth model. And one of the particular aspects of it that we really focused on, we had these foundational data items and analysis and the metrics. And, and again, we're, we're completely redeveloping how we uh, try to uh, uh, provide development monitoring uh, resources for local governments. So um, one of the things I wanted to, oops, too fast for me. Uh, we wanted to point out that, that the building permit data really is a central foundational component of that. This is why we're really wanna focus on that and, and, and give you some more information about that. But I wanted to, uh, the first step in that process really before we jump into, uh, you know, some kind of deep dive into building permitting. We wanted to get get an assessment of what kind of software is currently being used by the different jurisdictions. So let's uh, quickly go over that particular aspect. Um, we did a survey starting back right after the, the, the September Planning Directors Roundtable. Uh, we uh, uh, got a really good survey, I think. Uh, we, we The report covers things like who participated, how do you do jurisdictions manage building permits? What type of software do you use? And do you really public, do you do the jurisdictions public report activities? So again, we are very pleased with the results. We get 94 jurisdictions, uh, had to make several emails sometimes to get jurisdictions to participate, but some of you guys just jumped right in. So really appreciate that. 
We've got all 24 counties, 70 municipalities, a wide range from you know tens of thousands of people, uh, jurisdictions uh, to jurisdictions that had a hundred, a couple hundred people. Uh, so we really were pleased with the results and those participated, they really account for almost 100% of the new building permit activity. So we think we have a good picture of what's going on out there in the building permit reporting process. So um, in addition to that, uh, we, we wanted to find out, okay, now what kind of building permit activity processing we found out that most, uh, that, that a lot of counties actually, uh, all counties actually track building permit activities. Uh, and, and then uh, about uh, most of those counties actually have a third party, par party software. Um, we found two uh, large counties, uh, Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County actually have an in-house system. Technically Baltimore County has an in-house system, but it's my understanding that they're transitioning to a new system. So. A, a sizable portion of the, the, the building permit activity is really uh, utilizing these third-party software. And we also found out that a lot of these software companies are gobbling each other up. And so that the, the number of software companies is getting smaller and smaller. Smaller jurisdictions use um, have typically used Microsoft Office, either Excel or Access as their database uh, management system. Uh, and there's really only 16 vendors that currently uh, uh, serve uh, the, the, the bulk of Maryland Georgia jurisdictions dealing with building permit activity. And only six of those really do the bulk of the work. Uh, over 75% of all permits are done by only six different companies. So the question then is, okay, how's the reporting? Most jurisdictions, most counties and municipalities report that they report on uh, responded to the surveys. However, really only half of the counties and only 20% of municipalities actually post that information. And we also noticed that the posting information was pretty you know, varied and, and, and nothing really specifically uh, in that area. So uh, I, I thought that that was uh, a, a real interesting uh, aspect. So. Here are some of the recommendations that came out of that process. Uh, you know, we want to work with BMC, particularly to understand it. And we're going to hear from, from Sean in a minute uh, about uh, what's going on there and uh, maybe some lessons learned and opportunities that they have that we can potentially uh, participate, uh, participate in some type of statewide effort. We want to share some of the best practices and building permit activities and better understand the data recording that everyone has to see if we can share uh, how to improve that process. So that's something that, that we think there's an opportunity to work from out of this based on this uh, survey. Obviously, we want to explore opportunities where we can improve the sharing of what information so that uh, state agencies or local partners uh, can benefit from this process. Um, and then we want to obviously potentially explore the potential for a statewide building permit uh, system of, of, of tracking the system, tracking building permits similar to what uh, the BMC's model is currently be doing. Um, we also will be maintaining this uh, data set uh, and engaging local uh, partners along the way to possibly uh, you know, help facilitate uh, improvements or, or collaborations or trainings. Uh, and then we, we will share the contact information. Uh, we've not published that in the report. Uh, we're going to retain it. And if someone wants to have information about a particular uh, uh, who's using a software, they can contact the department planning. And we'll share this. So we're not going to publish those, those names, but we are going to retain it so that we can help share that information. Um, so I wanted to, to give you that context. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and at this point, I think so I, I did see uh, Secretary McCord uh, uh, show up in the panelists. So uh, before we jump to uh, Sean, uh, maybe uh, we can ask Secretary McCord to uh, say a few words to the group. Again, thank you, Secretary McCord. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I just uh, concluded the IAC meeting for this morning, um, our monthly meeting at the Interagency Commission on School Construction, but I'm happy to. Uh, just share a couple words with you right now. Um, the uh, you know the good things happening at planning 
uh, the compatible use website and handbook for the military facility and installations and the surrounding communities. That project's in full gear now, and uh, the consultants working with us and the work groups to try to set this up. And uh, we really want to make sure that these in installations that are innovation centers get um, a good relationship going with their local communities. The base commanders will change out and the elected officials will change out. We hope that we can set a process together where we avoid encroachment issues, and we can cooperate in technology transfer that's not classified coming off of those installations, and we can cooperate to make sure that they have um, a long and sustainable existence here in our state. Um, it's very important to the local economies where they exist. And we want to make sure that that continues. And uh, that's a very important project to me. And I hope that you will all cooperate in that process. And um, <clears throat> I, I hope that um, you're glad as I am that it's gotten started already. Um, the next thing is the Sustainable Growth Awards Program. Um, that will be starting April 29th through the July 23rd. And those awards can be found on the planning website. Um, there are um, reasons to make sure we continue to recognize people who are doing good things in this area. So uh, the Department of Planning will continue that tradition and um, ask you to think about making nominations for that. Um, they, um, the other thing is people always ask me about redistricting. And so redistricting is going to be underway in short order. The commission that the governor has appointed is going to be having its first meeting here in the beginning of May. And um, they will be supported by the Department of Planning. Um, I know that many of you are involved in redistricting at the council manic or the, um, you know, the commissioner level for districts within your counties. Um, we are all as, how do we say this, jammed up as everyone else with not having numbers as soon as we thought we'd have the numbers. But the Department of Planning will remind you that we will get numbers on our website that are the adjusted numbers that are to be used for Maryland as soon as humanly possible. So the, the Census Bureau says they will have data available at the end of September, September 30th. They also have said they would have legacy data, uh, the format of legacy data available mid to late August. So we are prepared to have our contractor use that legacy formatted data. And then we have to reallocate all of the incarcerated individuals in Maryland by Maryland law. So once we do that process, which could be three to four weeks to reallocate every prisoner to the last known address. That will be the adjusted data that's the official data that will be used for redistricting in our state. So just to let you know that whenever we get that data, we will do our work. We're all prepared to um, geolocate all of those prisoners back to their uh, census block where they came from before their incarceration. So that we're all ready to do that as soon as we get the data. So we will make the data available as soon as humanly possible. And we're trying to put every step in place beforehand to make sure that all we have to do is our piece of work and nobody's waiting on us. So we will do it as quickly as humanly possible to get it out to everybody who depends upon that census data. And um, that process will take um, quite some time for everybody jamming up against um, filing deadlines for candidacy and primary dates and we have received no, um, there was no relief in the General Assembly this year for any of those other deadlines. So we will go as quickly as possible to try to do that redistricting process. And I know many of you are dealing with that as the, the planning and zoning departments in your areas for redistricting also. So um, and we will do what we can to try to help as soon as we get the numbers. Um, and the last comment I'll make is about um, the population projections. Um, of course, everybody knows by now that the pandemic did not create the baby boom that we thought it would. Well, not we, but some people thought it would be like a blizzard and we'd have lots of children born, um, you know, nine months after the blizzard. That's not what has happened at all. All the preliminary information from all of the research that we've been able to review indicates the pandemic has produced a baby bust, which means there are implications for schools and housing, and we don't know what the rebound might look like from this situation. The, the academics are studying all the way back to the Spanish flu to find out what has happened in those previous situations. They're looking at the SARS um, issue up in Canada from several years ago. They're looking at how populations rebound from the situation. But what has happened is people are deciding to have families later in life. And now 
adding or starting a fam adding to or starting a family, some people apparently have decided um, they're not going to do it. They're not going to add to the family, or they're not going to start the family. They, they're they're just not going to they're just not going to do it. And economic uncertainty is one of the reasons why the families are not being generated in the same way they were pre-pandemic. So the economic uncertainty is causing all kinds of issues with population projections right now. We're trying to keep an eye on the latest academic data in addition to the latest data. So this all just bodes well for we have to continue to share information with each other about what we see is happening in our own jurisdictions. But just my, my preview is that the pandemic baby bust is something that we're going to have to think about. Um, and so, and my final comments um, to everyone who cares so much about the communities that they're in and doing the work that you do, is that I'm trying to reimagine a world where we don't use the word reimagine. I just want to dare to propose bold ideas. I want us to dare to think in new ways. And I want us to dare to cooperate in helping each other build better tomorrows. So. For everything that you do to contribute to that process, I'm, I'm grateful. We are the state agency that's trying to coordinate efforts for the state agency that's trying to make sure that we can add value to what you're doing and we can respect what you want to do locally. So um, I thank you once again for everything that you do and appreciate all of the work that you do and appreciate your attendance here at the, at the Planning Directors Roundtable. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary McCord. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to at this point turn it over to Sean Kimberly uh, for BMC to uh, give you a, uh, a look at their uh, building permit data system. Uh, welcome, Sean. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sean Kimberly, and I work at the Baltimore Metropolitan Council. I was invited here to talk with you this morning about our agency's building permit data system. So a thank you to Chuck Boyd and the Maryland Department of Planning for inviting BMC to address this group and talk about our system. And before starting, I do want to acknowledge Crystal McDermott of BMC, who is in attendance today. Crystal's primary responsibility at BMC is the maintenance of this building permit program from top to bottom. She works on the weekly maintenance of the system and is responsible for the development of many of the reports and data products that are produced. And she will be available to chime in and respond to specific questions this morning. Um, also, before uh, getting started in discussion about the building permit data system, I thought it might be helpful to provide a brief background on, on who we are. Uh, BMC is a nonprofit regional organization that works with the areas elected executives to identify mutual interests and develop collaborative strategies, plans, and programs that help improve our quality of life and economic vitality. The work of BMC staff includes transportation forecasting and analysis, economic and demographic research, air and water quality programs, multimodal planning, workforce development, housing, and cooperative uh, purchasing. And our region uh, consists of Baltimore City and, there's, and the surrounding six uh, jurisdictions, which happens to correspond to the definition of the Baltimore MSA. This slide provides an overview of the topic areas I plan to cover today, including where the data comes from, what data points are included, how the data is utilized, and the different data products we produce with the database. BMC has maintained an electronic database of, of uh, local building permit activity since 2000. The database was developed as, as a collaborative effort and with the full participation of our member jurisdictions. Every week, we receive building permits from six jurisdictions, uh, Baltimore City, Anne Arundel, Baltimore, Carroll, Hartford, and Howard counties. And we receive these permits in electronic format. A text file containing an agreed upon set of data points from the building permits issued during the previous week is auto-generated and sent to BMC staff. We have an in-house developed uh, application that assists in the upload of these permits into our building permit database. Once the local jurisdiction has set up the automated process for the creation and transmittal of the weekly text file, there's little else required from the local jurisdictions. 
and generally it is the IT department that is responsible for setting up the creation and delivery of the weekly text files. While weekly transmissions provided by most jurisdictions, permits from Annapolis and Queen Anne's County are handled on a monthly basis. Our database contains permits with estimated construction value of greater than or equal to $10,000. So our database is not exhaustive. Uh, we do not include every building permit issue. Uh, and we geocode all permits with estimated construction value of greater than or equal to $50,000. So these permits contain spatial information and can be mapped. Um, there are over 400,000, about 425,000 records in the database. Uh, we receive about uh, 800 of those a week and about 450 of, the, of those permits go into uh, the system. One of the challenges in putting this program together was that a, a new regional coding system had to be created in order to account for the differences in coding systems between jurisdictions. Uh, our, our building permit upload application runs the text file through a file mapper, which takes a first cut at assigning the, quote, appropriate uh, building permit code based upon a translation provided in a lookup table. Now, the system is not perfect, and not every permit receives a precise match via the automated file mapper. So we have a staffer uh, that is responsible for initiating and monitoring the import of building permits into our system and checking the permit coding to ensure that all permits are correctly translated into our region-wide coding system. An added benefit here to our local jurisdictions for participating in our system has to do with providing feedback. Uh, while our staffer reviews the coding of permits, uh, she also can pick up on anomalies in the permits and contact the local permitting agency to clarify any unusual observations. Uh, the typical example here has to do with uh, something like a, a typo in the amount field. Uh, for example, uh, the case of a 200-unit apartment building with an estimated construction cost of $200,000 would raise a flag, and our staffer would contact the local permit office to determine if the construction cost should be adjusted. Uh, as mentioned, uh, our, our system contains about uh, 20 years of information on a wide variety of uh, building permit types. Uh, including um, uh, residential unit types, such as uh, new single-family detached and attached, uh, multi-family and mobile home, as well as addition, alteration, and repair permits. Uh, Non-residential permit types include office, industrial, retail, lodging, and institutional, uh, among others. And uh, we also uh, collect and report on non-residential addition, alteration, and repair uh, permits. And since 2008, we have separately tracked permits for mixed-use structures. And mixed-use, in our definition, includes a residential and non-residential component in the same building. The building permit data is used in a variety of ways and, and by different types of users. Uh, internally, we use the data to support an assortment of planning and analytical efforts, including uh, in transportation planning and corridor analyses. Uh, the data helps to answer the question, what type of development is occurring around this transit line or this transit stop or uh, along this corridor? Some members of our cooperative forecasting group make use of the permit data in the development of their small area estimates and projections for households and employment, as it helps to provide an indication of development activity at the small area or transportation analysis zone. And it has uh, applications in our agency's housing work. Uh, and beyond, uh, as the spatial layer created from the data can serve as an informative and meaningful overlay onto just about any kind of planning analysis. Uh, the layer can be used as a proxy for development activity by type and by time period, and much of it is available at the point level. Uh, the data has a wide variety of applications outside of BMC's use as well. Uh, for example, we receive requests for the data from government agencies, including local planning departments, economic development agencies, budget offices, and local departments of transportation, as well as from state agencies, such as MTA and state planning, and from private sector businesses and uh, the public at large. In addition to the weekly maintenance of the database, uploading and reviewing the permits as we receive them, 
BMC staff also produces a series of products and reports based upon the building permit data acquired over time. Uh, products include monthly and annual building activity reports, building permit dashboards, uh, a few other annual reports, such as a report on uh, residential development activity by water and sewer service area, a report on the most productive residential developments by jurisdiction, um, and BPDS Online, which is a database tool allowing the user to query and download groups of individual permits that match their criteria. A permit quick viewer, which is an interactive map-based product. Uh, and also, we provide custom analyses upon request. Uh, BMC staff will work with local planning partners in the development of a custom analysis or building permit data extraction based upon the needs of individual tasks and projects. Now for a closer look at a few of these reports and products here. Uh, starting with the monthly uh, building activity reports, uh, this is an example of our monthly building activity report from September 2020. In 2020, uh, we updated our monthly building activity report to make them more visually appealing uh, and easier for readers to interpret, digest, and understand. The reports used to be largely text-based, but are now predominantly in a format of charts and graphs. The reports contain two pages for the region and for each jurisdiction, summarizing the monthly and year-to-date totals for residential and non-residential permitting activity, as well as providing a time series column chart highlighting the monthly activity over the course of the previous year. There's also uh, a series of tables at the end of the report that summarize the information for uh, all jurisdictions on the same page should the reader want to quickly compare and contrast data points uh, across jurisdictions. The annual report uh, contains a bit more specificity uh, in both the permit type and use detail, as well as the uh, uh, geographical uh, spatial detail. Our latest data product is a Tableau-based building permit dashboard tool. Uh, the tool started as a part of BMC's regional recovery dashboard, uh, which is a separate topic entirely. But in brief, uh, it is a dashboard that BMC launched in June of last year in an effort to aid our planning partners as we all worked to try and assess the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The dashboard includes data analysis and visualizations across BMC's various areas of focus, including housing, transportation, and uh, workforce development. For the building permit piece, uh, there are two separate dashboards, one for residential permit activity and one for non-residential permit activity. The tool is interactive and allows the user to create their own customized analyses by uh, providing selections for time period, monthly, quarterly, or annual, uh, geography, regional, or individual jurisdiction, uh, and by permit uh, type and use. There are two uh, visualizations in each of the dashboards. One presents the numeric values for the selected time period and data points. The second column graph shows the percent change uh, from the same period in the prior year. Uh, the combination of the two allows the user to quickly determine the current scale of permit activity, the direction of the trend over time, and how different the figures are from the previous year. Uh, th this new tool contains a, a lot of information and is uh, both versatile and user-friendly, making it a great resource for both experienced data users uh, as well as the public at large. Um, each year, uh, BMC staff creates a series of maps and summary tables highlighting the residential development activity occurring inside of and outside of uh, water and sewer service areas. Uh, this slide provides a summary table highlighting the share of permitted residential units that fall within each jurisdiction's sewer service area in 2019. Uh, the map uh, is an example from uh, Harford County, uh, illustrating the sewer service area boundary in the permitted units inside and outside of that map. BMC staff also summarizes the concentration of newly permitted units within the most productive residential developments in each jurisdiction uh, each year. This product provides summary tables and maps for each jurisdiction, highlighting the development name, number of permits issued, and type of unit for the developments that have contributed the most units to each jurisdiction's total for the year. 
our building permit data system online or BPDS online is a tool that allows the user to query and download groups of building permits. Uh, the permits can be queried by type and use, by issue date, estimated construction costs, and by jurisdiction. And uh, this tool allows the user to look at individual permits uh, rather than aggregate data summarized by geography. Uh, the data in this product is updated uh, each week. Uh, the building permit quick viewer contains a mapped representation of permits with estimated construction costs of greater than or equal to fifty thousand uh, dollars this product is intended to provide more of a spatial overview for permit activity displaying permits at the point level on an interactive map general information regarding permit type and use address and amount are included and can be viewed by hovering over specific points uh, this data product is updated by our GIS staff, and that occurs approximately once every two months or so. And finally, there are customized uh, data requests and analyses that are provided on an as-needed and as-requested uh, basis. These types of requests cover uh, really a, a wide assortment of topic areas, uh, but in many cases, the building permit data is being requested to serve as a contextual layer for one of many types of planning analyses, you know, such as housing analyses to monitor new residential development activity in and across a jurisdiction uh, and over time, uh, or for uh, policy analysis or as a performance measurement. Is development occurring within or outside of areas targeted for growth? Uh, and the example here has to do with examining residential permit activity in relation to transit stops and stations. Uh, the building permit layer can help to provide some understanding of the scale, intensity, and timing of residential development around transit. Is new development occurring near a particular tra transit station? How much of new residential and non-residential development activity is transit accessible? Um, so, uh, so I think I'm about the end of my allotted 15 minutes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a summary of our system. Uh, we're always happy to discuss it in more detail with anyone that is interested. So please uh, feel free to contact myself or uh, Crystal McDermott with uh, further questions. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I will say sure. uh, I like your audience. We're uh, completely uh, enthralled and, and engrossed in your, your presentation and the potential for opportunities there. And so as a result, no one has submitted a question. Uh, <laughs> we're going to give them uh, a, a minute uh, before we move on to see if anyone has a burning question. But uh, I know your contact information is there. Um, and with you and Crystal, and I, it's an outstanding uh, resource for the, the Baltimore metropolitan area. Um, and, and so uh, it, it's a great uh, model to uh, potentially emulate even in a, in a statewide or a broader context. So um, I want to, again, want to thank you and Crystal. I don't see any burning questions that are asked at this point. Uh, Again, feel free to contact uh, Sean uh, about the, the building permit uh, uh, data program that they have. Uh, and at this point, I think, again, thank you, Sean. I think we're going to turn it over to uh, Dave Gannett at MDE uh, to uh, talk about uh, um, the CS CRAP. Right. Thanks, Chuck. Yep, thank you, Chuck. How am I doing? Screen okay? Yeah, you're good. Okay. I'm going to use that little widget to get rid of that, uh, hide the control panel, and I think I'm good to go. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Again, my name is Dave Gannett. I'm the State Floodplain Coordinator for the Maryland Department of the Environment, and today I'm going to talk about the CRAB, the Climate Ready Action Boundary. Um, my job primarily is to make sure that every community in Maryland follows the steps needed to stay enrolled in the, in the federal ins flood insurance program. And in Maryland, that means that FEMA provides insurance that totals 14 and a half billion with a B dollars every year in the state of Maryland. That's a pretty good indicator of risk. And this crab is also an indicator of risk. So we wanted to understand the relationship to those two things. 
Um, how does this relate to the FEMA floodplain? And then leverage that to, to make, uh, you know, like a, a more financially sound investment or decision-making process as we, as we move forward. So I want to talk about the crab. When we use the word floodplain um, in relationship to the crab, and every community has a floodplain, so there's differences between those. So I want to show how it's different and how it sort of relates back to the crab. Um, this website is public facing, so there's no log on that you need. Um, and with that, let's get into it. All right. I want my slide. Okay. So real quick, the crab is um, I'm going to give you a 10 minute overview of this kind of at the International St Space Station level, explain what it is and why, and, and, and get you maybe a, a quick idea of how to use the crab data set. So the crab is the 100 year floodplain plus three feet up and out. Um, why the switch? The crab tool generates an elevation that's tied back to the FEMA floodplain. Every state agency has to use the CoSmart criteria. And now what we're giving every state agency is a tool that applies elevations and relates back to the FEMA flood elevations. And where does this apply? This applies in every coastal county in the state of Maryland. Okay. Again, it's tied to the coastal 100 year floodplain. It defines the risk by adding three feet vertically to the 100 year floodplain and determining the higher horizontal and wider limits of that FEMA floodplain. The CRAB applies to state, state projects and state spending on projects within the limits of the CRAB. All right. So state agencies have to follow the CRAB. They have to follow the CRAB for projects to cost more than $500,000. And if the state is providing money to, to locals, then the, the CRAB also applies to local projects if 50% or more of the cost is state funding and the state funding exceeds $500,000. Note, roads and bridges are exempt, but that's likely to be discussed this year. And for more details, you want to contact DNR or the state agency that is providing the funding uh, for a local project. Um, again, I am the state NFIP coordinator, or MDE. Um, the CRAB and the COSMAR Council is a group of state agencies that are chaired by the Department of Secretary of the Department of the DNR, all right? And so there are a, there's an awful lot of input, but I'm only developing the data as the state NFIP because it's coming from the floodplain data source. The COSMAR Council has been around since 2014. And since 2014, the COSMAR Council was started to make safe and fiscally wise investments when building or updating state agency structures located in vulnerable coastal areas. In 2014, the CoSmart process utilized a state two-foot freeboard, which you're taking the 100-year floodplain and vertically adding two feet. It was revised in 2017 or 18, sorry, I don't know the exact date, to use the category two storm surge areas. And this year, I, I believe in September of 2020, it was revised to include this, this CoSmart crab tool. And it, it's just, again, it establishes an elevation tied to the FEMA floodplains. All right, here's an explanation of how this all works. I'm gonna start with a profile view along the shore. Um, the dark blue at the bottom is an indication of sea level. The lighter blue on top of that is your FEMA flood elevation, all right? Everybody, state, local, and uh, fed, understand that we regulate on the landward side of, of the floodplain. All right, and we regulate between the yellow arrow at the bottom of the, on the at the bottom of the image. All right, we have regulations and we have a floodplain code that we follow inside those regulations. Those regulations generally stop at the edge of the floodplain. All right, and we all follow those regulations again tied to that that elevation. So what the crab relates to is what if we took the floodplain and we added three feet vertically to that. Again, I'm relating this back to, to sort of current codes is that a lot of communities also have a, have a free board of one, two or three feet, but we only have authority in that yellow uh, arrow at the bottom of the map. So if I have a one, two or three foot free board, I build 
um, to a higher standard in the current regulations in, inside the fleet limits of the FEMA floodplain. All right. What the CoSmart is doing is we're taking that 100-year floodplain, we're adding three feet vertically to, to it, but we're recognizing that there's nothing um, at the edge of the floodplain that's going to vertically keep the, 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 wall, the water from moving past that red arrow. All right. So if I have a flood of, that's three feet higher, if I have higher water elevations that's three feet higher, it, it, there's nothing that's going to magically make the water stop at that area. It's going to move inland. All right. And when that moves inland, that's where that's where we're going to define the crab limits. All right. So that movement inland is going to be the now, now the horizontal red arrow. It's going to carry you inland to that point of the crab. And we're going to then apply that principle so that the state is recognizing on state projects all the activities that could happen to the left of that, you know, like floodplain limit, and yet be enclosed in the area underneath the horizontal red dashed arrow. Okay, so two things are going to happen. There's going to be a higher floodplain in elevation inside the community's floodplain, which the state's going to follow. We're going to add three feet vertically to that. And then as I move inland, I'm going to have that other area that's going to be under the other hashed triangle. It's going to regulate or this, this designate what the procedures that the state agencies have to follow or state projects have to follow to get to that elevation. In both cases, you're going to be asked to either stay out of those areas or elevate to that elevation, that flood protection elevation, which is now the 100 year plus three. So this new line on the ground is gonna be called the crab, the, the limit of the crab. Um, the limit of the crab is uh, designated, you know, like at that area where, where we've had that run out. And I believe that runout is very close to the category two storm limits that we had in the in the in the criteria for Coast Smart through 2000 since 2017 or 18. Okay, very close, not exact. Um, you're 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 running elevations now, and when you run those elevations, you sort of have a, a trend that that could be different based on the source of information. But for the most part, we were very close to the 100-year floodplain and the crab matching the category two. Okay, so what's going on is you've got, again, the yellow, the yellow uh, arrows at the bottom that show you the limits that you're regulating on the ground. The new red arrows indicate the, the extension of that area that now has moved inland. And again, state agencies are going to be paying attention to how they're spending money um, under that safe and fiscally wise investments so that we're, we're elevating to that higher elevation of the crowd. Okay. The way this looks uh, on, a, on a plan view map is going to basically take you to the, those floodplain numbers. And on the floodplain side, we've got I've got the yellow arrow, double arrow that shows you the floodplain limits. We've cross-hatched the floodplain, so you understand that in this area you're adding three feet to the floodplain. And then from the break between the yellow arrow to the red arrow, we're moving inland, right? hence the one direction of the of the red arrow but we're moving inland and we're moving up the coast, so to speak, from, from that three foot depth down to a two foot depth to a one foot depth to you basically re, re reach land and you run out to zero. So it's basically giving you an indication of, of all the changes as you move inland. Um, the crab looks more like this, where you actually click on the, on the tool and you get an elevation of the ground, you get a return, you get an elevation that gives you the height, and then you get an elevation that adds those two heights together and gives you the crab elevation. So state agencies would then be asked to avoid these areas that are that are um, the shaded colors outside the floodplain. And if they cannot avoid, then they would be asked to elevate to that crab elevation height. So it gives you a tie-in to the FEMA elevations. It gives you a resiliency elevation to build to and it kind of illustrates how, uh, you know, like those, those two things are tied together. And again, on spending for state projects. So the tools and the website that you would use, uh, the crab tool is at mdfloodmaps.net slash crab. 
And if you wanted to see the story map that kind of illustrates that, you know, like how he came through that, that effort, it's, it's also, there's, there's a tool there. I'm going to send this finished presentation to um, Chuck and John, and they will probably distribute it probably right before the end of the, the session today, okay? If you have any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms um, on the data, um, here's my point of contact. I'm certainly willing to discuss anything that we've done and how we've done it. Um, but again, if, if it's really talking about the CoSmart criteria, I think the, the question is more applicably applied to DNR and the CoSmart, full CoSmart Council. But I can also relate those questions also if you have them. So I'm going to jump back to, how much time do I have left, John? I think you're 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 doing fine, but uh, maybe at this point, uh, unless you have something else, then we can get, go to, to to Meredith and and Jessica, and then uh, we can answer any questions. But you're you're doing fine. Okay, that's good. Well, then I, I was going to jump to the the CoSmart the Crab website, but I'll I'll just leave this open, and then when we come back to questions that later on. We'll wrap it up. So I'm going to turn that over to uh, Jessica or Meredith, um, and kind of sit back and see what everybody else has. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. John, please direct the screen to Jessica. I was not able to pregame, so can you all hear me now? Yes, you're fine. Okay. Um, I am co-presenting with Jessica Shear. She's going to navigate the slides, uh, and I will just ask her to advance. But thank you for the invitation to share the data visualization and information products that my team at Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration delivers. All of the tools that you will see here today are available through our MDOT uh, AGOL IMAP portal and links will be provided after the meeting. Next slide, please. The uh, in we in MDOT SHA's Innovative Planning and Performance Division provide data visualization tools for performance, asset, and risk management. I'm just going to show you a couple of tools and then we'll go to a live tour. The first one is forthcoming. It's a Maryland performance and analysis tool that conflates the performance metrics that you see on the right hand to our one Maryland, one centerline authoritative roadway network in Maryland. We have taught ourselves how to fish. Well, actually we learned from Cat Lab, uh, but we've stood up this tool to be able to on demand and uh, provide this information and for you all to be able to navigate the same information that we navigate. There's a truck only lens as well. Next slide, please. Uh, just to put you all on notice, per federal regulations, we are to update the Maryland Transportation Asset Management Plan for the National Highway System, delivered to the federal FHWA in October of 2022. The update process is underway. If you are one of the partner owners listed, we will be in contact and more information can be found on the website link that, again, we'll share later. Next slide, please. The highlight for today's presentation is a tool that MDOT SHA has provided for a number of years. The Climate Change Vulnerability Viewer is publicly accessible, hosted through uh, IMAP and maintained by our amazing data governance and information information systems team at MDOT SHA. We continue to add information into the viewer, the publicly accessible viewer, including the crab boundary. Jessica will give you a live tour of that. And the power of the tool is the ability to layer a wealth of information, uh, both your local agency information and our state information, whether it is assets, uh, layers, whether it is volume and performance layers, and the climate and risk uh, information. If you are new to the viewer, please feel free to navigate to the link. Again, we'll provide that and start on the screenshot on the screen 
there is a little uh, 11 minute introductory video that gives you a tour of the wealth of information available through the viewer. I really encourage you all to visit it, navigate it, click, point, click, uh, and see what's there. If you aren't able to access it or if the video doesn't give you enough uh, introduction and you want to dive deeper to the power of the, the vulnerability viewer or if you want to partner with us to be able to overlay your information in the viewer please please feel free to reach out to me and Jessica our contact information will follow this is a huge powerful tool that many many of our partners rely on and we are honored to be to provide this product and service to you and always are looking to partner and enhance its value. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and if technology allows, she's gonna give you a quick live tour uh, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you very much. Jessica, I can see your screen. Thank you, Meredith. So I'm Jessica Shear from Blackwater Environmental Group and as Meredith said, I assist her in the Innovative Planning and Performance Division. And right now we're looking at um, the Climate Change Vulnerability Viewer. I've already zoomed in just for the um, for time's sake, but I wanted to also reiterate that even if you're not a data person and GIS really isn't your background and, you know, looking at that kind of an, and talking about that kind of information makes you uneasy or you're just not comfortable with it, this map is super easy uh, to get a, a snapshot of information and, and just kind of look around. You really um, can't mess it up. So uh, the first thing I want to draw attention to is that there are various different layers of um, base maps that you can choose from. Um, it's certainly you can use the one that already pops up for you or if you choose to have additional imagery then you can um, choose one of additional interest. I'm just going to zoom, oh I apologize for that, uh, zoom in a little bit more but I'd like to draw your attention to the top right corner up here is where you'll have your icons and that will navigate you through what type of information and data is available to you. Um, the first one that we have is the nuisance tidal inundation and we have different um, year projections that you can look at. If you um, use the legend, it'll go through and show you um, exactly what the different colorations mean and how that might affect certain areas um, of interest to you. The second one is roadway inundation. And you might look at this list and go, oh my gosh, what is all of that? Um, it's really just different scenarios. Do you wanna be conservative and look at a no storm event? Do you wanna look, be aggressive and say, okay, what happens if a 500 year storm event occurs? Um, it just gives you different information um, depending on how you want to um, run an analysis or, or look at your local area. And this one is looking at inundation and sea, sea level rise and mean high or high water. And if you're like, I don't even know what that means, there is information up at the top here that you can um, click on that really explains all of that information and gives you definitions and walks you through what, what some of those more technical terms are. And it's as easy as clicking on um, these boxes and you will see the different areas of interest um, start to highlight and you can zoom into those. The next one is the flood depth grids and I wanted to point this one out because in good partnership with other state agencies, we've incorporated the CoSmart uh, crab layer that Dave just um, reviewed and went over. And this is really helpful for the state as we are going to have implications to our projects as well and how that might uh, impact infrastructure and infrastructure projects within this layer. So you can certainly um, utilize that as well. And again, there's a legend where you can um, find more information uh, regarding what you're looking at, as well as um, a additional information with the flood depth grids, which we are looking to begin to um, update within the next year as it becomes available. Oh, apologize. The other one I think would be a real interest um, for you all is that we actually modeled Flor uh, Hurricane Florence, which happened in 2018 in the Carolinas. Um, it was a huge uh, 
a, a storm event with a lot of rainfall for several days. And so not only was there coastal flooding from storm surge, um, but there was also a lot of inland flooding. And, and we were interested um, from a state perspective of saying, well, how, how might that um, look if that were to happen in Maryland? And what is our roadway infrastructure that would be impacted? And you can see here, there's different um, water depth levels that you can look at. Um, also, what I think would be really interesting um, to note for you all on this meeting today is that it also includes inundated parcels. So you can really start to, to zoom in, whether you're having community meetings or you're looking at facilities and your infrastructure, how does this um, potentially impact um, your, your areas of concern? And so it has um, all of this information for you as well. Um, just to kind of play out scenarios or um, looking at future uh, concerns. The other component that I just would like to point out is there's a lot of other related data as well, but um, specifically just want to call out that you can highlight the FEMA hurricane uh, evacuation routes. So maybe you want to you know overlay that with the hurricane uh, Florence model and um, you can kind of start to come up with planning exercises and thinking about how this might be certain critical aspects to um, your network. It also has roadway functional class, so you can look at the local level um, as well as the state. And so with that, um, I just really wanted to give a high level um, kind of overview of some of the information available. Um, and uh, with, with that, I will turn it back over to Chuck. Uh, I think we're about at our time. And again, if you have any questions, um, you want more additional information, we're happy to work with you. Please give Meredith or I a call and we can discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, uh, I know Dave didn't have a chance to really show the, the uh, the CS Crab uh, application, uh, but I, I do encourage you to, to, to go and, and look at that. I do have two questions, uh, and we have a few minutes left to um, have uh, other people write in their questions. So I think this first one will go to, to Dave. Uh, uh, how, how would the CS Crab area affect local projects? When would state transportation need to consider mitigation of the crab area? Bihoy uh, Shu asked that question. I don't know if, if first maybe Dave and then um, then uh, maybe either Jessica or uh, Meredith could deal with the transportation. So the first question is for, for uh, Dave is how would the crab area affect local projects? So it's a great question, by the way. Thank you. Um, the the crab. The crab, the way it was it was set up, was for buildings for this year, um, and spending. So, what are we doing in in those areas? Um, obviously, uh, when you're when you're looking at roads, there are a number of other things that come into play. You know, like the, the for transportation networks and stuff like that. So, um, the Coast Mark Council basically, uh, I wouldn't say cut our losses, but stopped. Our consideration and made sure we updated the information this year for buildings um, with the understanding that we would continue to meet this year and, and discuss roads and transportation network and, and, and things of that nature. Um, if we build a bridge that was for that applied to Coastmark Council, it would best basically go up in the air three feet. And then what do you do for all the approaches to that bridge? And what do you do to all the flooding on both sides of that bridge in and in and out of that area? So there's a number of factors that we have to sort of get our head around. And for that reason, transportation is not considered in the crab, but the information is noted and maybe you would still make some kinds of some kind of influence on that decision. Hopefully that's enough. Jessica, do you have anything to add? Uh, just, just to clarify um, the, the answer, I think the, the first question dealt with in terms of the local was, as long as it's not uh, 500,000 of state funding, or it's not a state project, right? That's correct. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, you're right. If it, if it's a local project with local funding, then the crab application does not apply. All right. So that that's that's correct. And, and just then, there's another question on, on the, related to its application to private 
Um, uh, the, uh, Jill Baker asked this, says, wasn't there a bill in the General Assembly this year requiring private developers to adhere to the craft boundary? Uh, and did that pass? It's my understanding that did not pass. That, can you correct, reflect, clarify that? I believe you're correct. And at the same time, I'm not, I'm not sure that one was waived past my desk for, for comment. So I, I'm, I'm hearing that sort of secondhand. So yes. Okay. Uh, uh, Jessica or uh, uh, Meredith, do you have any comments on how the, the, the crab is going to be integrated into transportation planning? You want to take it, Meredith? So, you know, that's one of the reasons that we added into the Climate Change Vulnerability Viewer. The CCVV it has applications beyond transportation, you know, we are a customer of that authoritative layer and make it available through the CCVV. And our uh, design teams across all varieties of our 14 asset classes in SHA, along with our other partner, own, excuse me, other um, TBUs in MDOT, do look to the CCVV uh, early in project identification, design and planning to consider all of those elements in any uh, design project. And again, the information is publicly available to partner owners as well. So where applicable, it absolutely applies and informs project identification and design. Great, thank you. Um, just, to, just to clarify th that uh, um, this does not, the CRAB doesn't really provide information to uh, riverine or inland flooding areas, or does it? Or does the, either of your two applications address in, uh, uh, inland flooding areas? So, it, so if you if you read my mind, not my presentation, you you would have actually you, yeah, that that would be that source. Um, so this year the crab is addressing that 100 plus three in coastal areas for the Coast Smart Council. As the state floodplain coordinator, I think that information is valuable to have inland, and we've secured enough money for FEMA this year that we will be developing 100 plus three for the riverine areas of the state also. Um, there are some areas of the coast, coastal counties, that we've got that sort of disconnect where we sort of stop right at the, at the tidal limits. So it would make sense to at least finish that and apply that there. Um, so we are going to develop that data, but that data is really only for information purposes. There will be no regulations tied to it from the CoSmart that I'm aware of. Right, Jessica, does your application have any riverine flooding impacts in it? I don't, I'm not 100% sure. No, it does not. I think that there is a lot of interest for that um, for the state as well. Um, so that's something that we would like to see progress. And, in, and then once it is available, certainly we would love to put it in the CCVV. Okay, the last question I'm just gonna, uh, it's a comment from Amy Mordock that uh, suggests that this resource be incorporated into the Chesapeake Bay crossing tier uh, two uh, NEPA study. I don't know if uh, Jessica or uh, uh, Meredith have a reaction to that. Uh I would ask for a clarification. The CCVV, I can't speak to the project team if they did avail themselves of the CCVV, but we can certainly reach out to them and double check that they did. Uh, I'm not well versed on their NEPA study as it currently exists, but we can certainly connect with that team. Great, understood. Again, I wanna thank all three of you, Dave, Meredith, and, and Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, at this point, we are going to keep on slightly on schedule. We're a little bit off behind, but we're doing good. So uh, if you, again, if you need any more information about this, we will be posting their presentations with along the links, uh, and you can uh, access them from the planning director's roundtable. The next item is uh, dealing with environment, the electric vehicle program. And, and so at this point, I want to just give you a little bit of precursor to this. Uh, with the number of electrical vehicles in Maryland's roads growing and demand for EV charging options is growing as well, 
Utility companies have a variety of tools to help non-residential, residential property owners install chargers. The, the Maryland Zero Emissions Electrical Vehicle Infrastructure Council, the council tracks EVs, E, I never can do it, ZV, ZEVs, I'll get it right, ZEVs and EV infrastructure in Maryland. The council's 27 members are appointed by the governor of the legislature, and they represent a variety of stakeholder active in the development of the EV infrastructure. Under a pilot program established by the Public Service Commission, all Maryland utilities have an incentive program uh, related to multifamily properties. And uh, the focus of the particular today's presentation by Christy Fleshman Gronke from, M from BGE is to uh, part of the outreach and incentive that the focus on the multifamily residential communities. Also uh, attending today are representatives from Potomac Edison um, and the Southern uh, Maryland uh, uh, Electric Cooperative. The purpose of this presentation is to seek planners, uh, agencies, input, assistance, and partnership to help implement the incentive programs. For instance, local uh, planning agencies could make multifamily home uh, housing developers aware of such incentives and even encourage the developer to consider these programs in the site design subdivision review process along the way. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Christy fleshman Gronke to talk about the multifamily EV charging station incentive program that they run. Uh, welcome, Christy. Thank you very much. And I just wanna confirm before I start that you're seeing my presentation. You, you, we could see it. All right, great. So thank you for that introduction. I'll be covering all of this, the Maryland um, utility programs, but as, as was mentioned, there's other utility representation on the call. So they feel free to chime in um, when we get to the question and answer portion. So moving to the first slide, um, Maryland has a goal of 300,000 EVs on the road by 2025. Right now, I think we're close to 32,000 registered EVs in Maryland. And the Maryland Public Service Commission felt it was important that the Maryland utilities help play a role in supporting Maryland's goal by providing customer education and tools, as well as outreach to our customers to let them know the benefits of electric vehicles and that we're here to help them make that transition. We have uh, all of the utilities in Maryland have programs supporting residential customers. Um, we're providing rebates to residential customers that purchase and install EV charging for their single family homes. Um, we also are installing our own utility uh, owned and operated public charging stations on government property. So our charging stations must be installed on state, county, or local municipal property. Um, be available to the public 24 seven. And we're putting them in the communities where the private charging companies like Tesla, Electrify America, EVGo, um, focus on the main highways and corridors for you know, their fast charging to, to charge vehicles as, as they make some longer drives. But we're putting our infrastructure in the local um, communities at local parks, libraries, schools, community colleges, so that um, customers start to see charging stations, you know, near their home, in their communities, places they go every day, and feel comfortable making the switch. We're also offering rebates to multifamily properties uh, to help support charging for tenants, and that's what my presentation will cover today. Um, between the Maryland utilities, so BGE, Pepco, Delmarva, and Potomac Edison currently have multifamily rebate programs. And through all of those uh, four utilities, we are offering 950 rebates and then 40 utility owned charging stations, which I'll get into the details of on my next slide. So, starting with BGE's multifamily program, we are offering rebates to multifamily property owners and developers. This includes condos, apartments, HOAs, any location where uh, a, a resident 
wouldn't be able to install charging stations themselves where they don't own the property or the parking space where their car would be charging. So BGE offers a $5,000 rebate for level two chargers, 15,000 for DC fast chargers, total of 700 rebates available, and um, the max per location is, is 25,000. So you could install five level two charging ports or a combination of a DC fast charger and level two. Uh, and those, for those that may not know the difference, a level two charger is at 240 volt. So it charges a car fully in about four to six hours. Um, that's what a single family home uh, owner would install in their house. So it, it, it is sufficient for overnight charging or somebody that you know is gonna be parked at a place for a longer period of time. DC fast chargers um, are 480 volt. They charge a car fully in about 30 minutes, but the infrastructure is much more expensive. A DC fast charger is in the range of $50,000 for just the equipment, uh, where a level two charger is about $3,000. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of traction in this rebate program, uh, which I'll have some slides to, to get into those details as well. So BGE proposed to the Maryland Public Service Commission in our last semi-annual report, which was submitted on February 1st of 2021, um, that we try a different approach. Uh, so BGE proposed owning and operating chargers at multifamily properties, just like we're doing for our public charging stations on government sites to see if that had a, a bigger uptick in multifamily participation. So BGE would um, cover the cost of purchasing the charger. We would install the charger, per, uh, set our own meter so that we're billing ourselves for the energy that's consumed at the chargers. And um, some of the feedback we're receiving is that the upfront cost of the charging stations, you know, is something that the property managers aren't willing to take on yet. So. We just got started with this program. We're able to install 40 dual port level two charging stations um, at various multifamily properties. We can install a max of four level twos per location. So if we you know, do install four at each location, that would give us 10 multifamily properties that would be able to participate um, in this trial period. We have a mid-course review due to the Maryland Public Service Commission on September 15th of 2021. So we'd like to get you know, some results of this, this program carve out um, to the commission in that report to see if this is a, a better approach to take. Moving to PHI's multifamily program. So this is for Pepco and Delmarva, Maryland. Um, they have a similar program, except that you receive a 50% discount when you purchase the level two chargers at the point of sale, and then they provide up to $7,500 to install the charging stations. Um, they, Pepco has 200 chargers and Dalmarva has 50 chargers available in their rebate program. And then next is Potomac Edison. Uh, their program is similar to BGE. They have a, a rebate per port of $5,000 for level two chargers, uh, as well as their DC fast chargers. They have a max of 50 rebates available with a $20,000 cap per location. Then getting into some of the challenges that we're hearing, um, as I mentioned, a main one is the upfront cost of the charging stations and as well as, you know, the installation of those charging station and who pays for the electricity. Um, so that, that's been a main sticking point in, in some of the apartment and condo as well as HOA um, properties that we've spoken to that, you know, once the charger's installed and a meter is set, or it shows up behind an existing meter, how is that multifamily property made whole for the electricity? 
Um, HOAs have some different hurdles um, based on where to put the charging stations. And as HOAs are often spread out over a larger period, uh, a larger plot of land. So putting them, you know, at let's say the front of the development might not reach, you know, properties further back in the development. You don't have, you don't see that as much of a problem in an apartment building or condo building because the parking is pretty centralized, but you cover a lot of land in HOAs, so it becomes an issue of where to put them. And that's an issue really for all three types, apartment condos and, multi and um, HOAs in where you have assigned parking or deeded parking, or you have some tenants that have EVs now. So maybe you put charging stations where they park, but what, what happens when the next tenant gets an EV? Um, you know, how do you kind of future proof the, um, your, your parking facility to allow EV uh, drivers to charge? But right now, the third bullet is that we have limited multifamily tenants asking for chargers. So this, you know, gets into the, the chicken and egg concept that's discussed a lot um, in the EV industry is that, um, you know, when there's charging stations, you see a higher adoption in EVs. So the, the charging stations kind of bring uh, EV adoption because seeing them in, in their um, apartment, condo, HOA area, they, they think, oh, I can make this switch where, not having the the chargers would limit some multifamily residents from from considering an EV. You do see small numbers today. Some of the customers that have participated in our multifamily program uh, participated because they had a group of of tenants that were asking for chargers. They got an EV or ordered an EV and were being proactive about finding. Uh, a charging solution for them. Uh, sort of mentioned bullet four, where to put the chargers and uh, do they restrict usage to the chargers to just certain individuals or if you have visitors to those communities, are they allowed to, to use the charging stations? And lastly, um, through the Maryland Public Service Commission approved programs, we have limited uh, education and outreach budgets, and this is a, a hard group to message to. Um, you know, using utility billing systems, which we typically use for marketing campaigns, those would be going to the accounting offices of the multifamily properties, and not to you know the facilities managers or uh, whoever would be able to make these decisions. So all of our outreach is really on an individual basis as we get leads through tenants, through other um, groups, some direct outreach. Um, BGE has used our prior list of, of multifamily customers that participated in our energy efficiency programs um, to reach out and, and make some connections, but it, it's not something that we can do some wide marketing campaigns to, um, to get a larger number of participation. The next slide just covers some, some considerations. Uh, BGE has made a few proposals to the Maryland Public Service Commission through our semi-annual reports. Uh, as mentioned, they, they approved the first, uh, first sub-bullet here that for the utility owned and operated chargers. We've also proposed expanding the rebate program to include nearby commercial locations. So let's say the grocery store next door was willing to put in charging stations. Um, you know, could the utilities rebate those installations because they could support multifamily charging? Uh, another idea was to provide discounts uh, to multifamily tenants to use fast chargers. So if they don't have level two chargers at their um, facility, then a nearby fast charger, they could get the quicker charge um, and go back home. The issue with using fast chargers without discounts is 
there's awful, often a higher uh, price per kWh, so it really isn't economically feasible for many tenants just to rely on DC fast chargers. Uh, some ways that we could get more introductions um, to property owners and developers would be much appreciated. When we do have those one-on-one -on -one conversations, they're often um, fruitful and, and we are at least start a dialogue about EV charging. Um, we've been trying to work with vehicle dealerships throughout our service territory to uh, be part of the buying journey so that if a customer that's buying an electric vehicle lives at a multifamily property, we could reach out to the multifamily property, let them know, let them know they might get this request from the tenant so they're more informed as the tenant begins to make the request as, as, as opposed to trying to catch up um, after they have tenants asking for this amenity. And then we have some um, individuals within Maryland that have done some case studies, but perhaps developing a better educational packet, case studies, you know, what are other, other multifamily properties doing, such as, you know, forming a peer group where they could really um, discuss best practices regarding the either charge or purchase installation and ongoing utility bills. Next slide is just turning over for questions. I listed the specific utility contacts um, for the utility. So if you have any additional questions beyond this invite, I mean, sorry, beyond this meeting, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Thanks, Christy. We do have a few questions and encourage anyone else to, to submit those questions in the, in the questions uh, toolbox. Um, one question that, that I received was just curiosity. Uh, are any of these charging stations powered by or utilize solar? We don't have any um, per specific requirements in our current program structure to um, utilize solar. It is being done in other areas. Um, and, and it's definitely a great solution, especially um, for locations that may have some concerns with install, like if they need a service upgrade, it definitely can help um, offset some requirements. But there's no uh, incentives to promote solar and EV chargers together. Okay, understood. Um, is there a mechanism, uh, and it sounds like you, you, you don't have quite have this problem yet with, you know, overwhelmed with the number of requests, but uh, is there a mechanism to, uh, uh, in, in place to avoid concentration of these charging stations in possibly higher income communities, or, or are you looking at the distribution of that in terms of uh, providing it, um, you know, again, in a broad range of areas? Yes, yeah, so we're definitely um, taking a, a close look at um, where the distribution of these charging stations are from the ones that BGE is in, has control over the installation for our public charging stations. Um, we are definitely ensuring that those charging stations are installed in low income areas and that they're equitable throughout our service territory. It's a little harder for the rebate program because we're just receiving the applications. Um, but BGE is excited later this year to launch a rideshare program. So we'll be deploying 100 EVs um, in the Baltimore area for ride hailing services, which will directly benefit low income areas. And we'll be installing charging stations in those areas, um, as well as reaching out to multi-family Properties that have uh, properties that have uh, drivers that would to have level two charging stations installed, so that the drivers renting these EVs have a place to charge them. Great, understood. And then I guess it's just as close up because we're going to move on to our, our next section. But uh, um, is there? Uh, I guess you, you've talked about how to. The, the question really is. How do jurisdictions can support this effort? Uh, do they just 
if, if there's interest in, in, at the local level, they should contact you so that they can get more information or probably try to maybe possibly talk to uh, uh, some of their development review staff to be more informed about how to uh, possibly integrate um, charging stations and multifamily developments into their de discussions with uh, developers of those multifamily areas. Yeah, so that, that would be wonderful. I mean, again, our contact information is listed. All of the utilities also have um, web pages dedicated to EVs. If you go to our respective utility sites, you can find the electric vehicle pages. So there's a wealth of information there as well, but we'd love to be part of those conversations. Um, it is somewhat foreign, you know, to, to new customers. So we'd love to know, you know, any upcoming property are in the pipeline. It's, it's definitely more cost effective if it's a new construction type project to build in EVs um, into their plans and have the conduit poured and you know all of that done while the construction is happening as opposed to going back later and and redoing it. And the last thing I'll add really quickly is you know beyond the utility incentives, there's also state and federal incentives for EV infrastructure. The, the state provides um, a rebate or incentive up to $4,000 and the federal government is $30,000 right now. And that you know, may change given some of the recent announcements from the federal administration, but there's a wealth of incentives available to help support this today. And that's not always gonna be the case. And, and tenants are gonna start really demanding this as an amenity. So it's, it behooves the multifamily properties to take advantage now while they have the um, funding and resources available. Thanks, Christy. Um, just uh, Hallie uh, Erickson has just noted that for EVs, they should contact Hallie Erickson at icf.com. And I think John can put this information in, in the chat to let everyone know uh, for e. Uh, Z E E V I C uh, to send suggestions or questions to all the utilities. So again, thank you so much, Christy, uh, Hallie, mm -hmm. and, and all the folks. Uh, at this point, we're going to try to stay on schedule somewhat here. Um, and at this point, uh, uh, we'll uh, go into some uh, updates. So uh, we're going to switch screens here. And uh, at this point, uh, we're going to go through uh, lightning fast, uh, although, we're, again, we've got about uh, uh, 20, 30, 25 minutes or so. So um, at this point, I want to uh, go to uh, – uh, okay. sorry about that. Uh, we want to go to uh, Andrew Mengel uh, for DNR uh, with an update on the LPPRP. Andrew, welcome. Hey, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. So um, as Chuck mentioned, I've been invited today to give a brief update on the development process for the 2022 Land Preservation Parks and Recreation Plans and the engagement that DNR and MVP has been involved in with the counties. So uh, first, for anyone who's not familiar with these plans, the LPPRPs are comprehensive planning documents that are used by the counties in Baltimore City as an opportunity to collect and evaluate parks, recreation, and land preservation data. These plans are meant to identify the rates of public participation in specific types of recreation and the availability of those facilities that provide those types of recreation. And there's special emphasis placed on the proximity of parks facilities to where people live and especially to underserved communities. The draft guidelines for the 2022 LPPRP planning cycle were distributed to the counties in August of last year. The guidelines are meant to establish the minimum criteria for LPPRPs, including reporting standards and standards for methodology in determining park access and equity to those underserved populations. These guidelines also provide counties additional resources, including links to GIS data and surveys for developing their plans. We sent out these draft guidelines to the counties with the intention of receiving their feedback and suggestions in the past several months since these were distributed have been incorporated into the guidelines. And uh, DNR and MDP have also been hosting 
around one to two technical assistance meetings with the county LPPRP leads every month. These provide uh, DNR MVP and the county leads with an opportunity to answer any questions that may have come up during the development process, as well as enabling us to share resources such as recreational survey templates, RFP templates, and scopes of work that some of the counties are using. And the feedback we received from this is that having these meetings has been extremely helpful and the, the resource sharing has really benefited the counties in their overall development process. So MDP and DNR have also hosted two GIS specific trainings for county GIS leads. These trainings have covered Chesapeake Bay program data standards for land preservation and made DNR and MDP's existing GIS data sets available to the counties for use in their plans. MDP has also developed a GIS tool to assist in converting county level preservation data into the Chesapeake Bay program standard data sets. So throughout the rest of this year, MDP and DNR will continue to offer our technical assistance meetings with the local LPPRP leads, and the guidelines will be finalized and distributed, and the counties will be submitting their draft LPPRPs to both MDP and DNR at the end of this year. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take those now, or if you'd like to contact me later, my contact information will be at the last slide on this presentation. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. We'll we'll uh, ask people to submit those comments, and we'll unmute you if we receive any comments at the end. So at this okay, point, we will uh, move on to uh, an update on one of our uh, components of the the growth and mo growth um, rethinking our growth model, um, and it is uh, dealing with the the census update. So Al, tell us about the census. <laughs> Thank you, Chuck. I think you skipped one slide. If you can go Oops. back one slide, I'll start there. Sorry about that. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so before I get into the redistricting data schedule, I would like to mention uh, earlier this week on the 26th, the Census Bureau released the apportionment data uh, for the United States. Uh, that included the state population totals for all the states, and Maryland state total was 6.177 million. Uh, and we didn't lose or gain any congressional uh, representation. We still are going to have our eight congressional seats. Uh, that's what we were um, uh, aware of, and that's good. So with that said, uh, the next step of the data the Census Bureau is going to release is the redistricting data that is used to redraw the congressional district lines based on the population. And as Secretary McCard mentioned, uh, they're going to release this data in the middle to the late August time period uh, the, in the previous version format, basically it's a text file that we will be use, using to join uh, to uh, the census geographies files to get an idea of where the population are at the block level. And uh, they also, the Census Bureau also mentioned by September 30th, they will release the same data with additional features being like the user would have an interactive capability to look at the data visually uh, uh, with, with in reference to the geography. But we at the Department of Planning are planning to use the data that's going to be released uh, uh, in August and set it up and be ready to use it for redistricting. As Secretary McCord mentioned, Maryland has this unique responsibility of the law that requires that we address the prison population to make sure that they're counted at the place where they lived before and not at the prison facility. To address that requirement, we have a consultant that would help us with this process. Uh, they mentioned that they would need three weeks time to uh, address that requirement where they are reallocating the prison population to the census blocks. And after that's done, uh, we at the Department of Planning would need about like a week to make sure that the data looks right. And we, after we QC it, and we have to make sure that the data is available on our website. So that will take about a week. So uh, technically, uh, in terms of speaking, we would uh, roughly need about four weeks from the date when the data is released to have the data available to be used for redistricting. And uh, uh, this data is going to be posted on a redistricting website. And um, also on our redistricting website, uh, we have information on the timeline of the data that's going to be released and how it's going to be released. And uh, this is the data that needs to be used to redraw uh, the legislative, congressional, and the local districts as well. So the next item I would like to go over is the PUMS uh, data or the PUMAs. The PUMAs are public use micro data areas that represent uh, roughly about 100, not roughly, at least 100,000 people. The PUMAs that are drawn, uh, the geography need to have this 100,000 people for throughout the whole decade. 
So the official program announcement is going to be done sometime in September by the Census Bureau. And in fall, the Census Bureau is going to conduct training on how to redraw the Puma boundaries. So what we will try to do is we will uh, reach out to all the counties with this information as we receive. Being the uh, state data center, we are designated to uh, act as a liaison for the Puma program. So uh, we will coordinate with the counties that have at least 200,000 people or more if they are interested to delineate their Pumas within the county. If they don't, we will do that. But counties below 200,000, we have to address that as a part of collectively because some counties probably won't reach the 100,000 threshold. So we, we will coordinate with all the counties and set, uh, set up a timetable on how to address this requirement. The Puma data basically has uh, ACS surveys that are do done at, for individuals uh, that will help uh, determine um, the interactions between uh, that big geography of where people live and what their earnings are. And you can cross tab this information in several ways to get specific details. So that's the second program. Uh, the next one is the urban areas. The Census Bureau proposed uh, changes to the criteria on how they define urban areas using the 2020 census. So this particular urban area uh, criteria is under uh, federal register notice for um, in the common period. Uh, just a quick, quick highlight on what they're defining, the, some of the proposed changes. Um, they are getting rid of urban clusters and urbanized areas, and they're just calling everything an urban area. And these urban areas need to have at least 10,000 people or 4,000 housing units. And a couple of other minor things, I guess, are like they reduce the distance that urban areas can jump from 2.5 miles to one and a half mile. And Previously, they were focused on the populations per square mile as one of the criteria to determine urban areas, but now, now they are getting away from that and using uh, housing unit density per square mile there as um, a, a qualifying criteria for urban areas. I think they mentioned 385 housing units per square mile uh, to meet the urban area threshold criteria. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to help the MPOs, the metropolitan planning organizations with the mapping assistance to show uh, not all, but the smaller MPOs uh, with uh, how their urban area might change based on some of these proposed criteria. Uh, we have prepared maps, which we will be sharing with the MPOs uh, so that they can provide comments uh, to the Census Bureau. And uh, if a particular county is not a, sub, not a part of the MPO, please uh, reach out to me. My information is at the end of the slides. I will be happy to provide the maps we've prepared. Uh, a couple of other things, the comments for the urban areas are due before May 20th. So keep that in mind when you're addressing your comments. And uh, we are also preparing comments, but that, our comments would be state specific uh, and at a bigger scale. And I would encourage the MPOs to sub, submit the comments because that would be more important to what might happen in their areas. And finally, uh, this is more of an FYI, the Metropolitan Statistical Areas, the Office uh, the uh, OMB, Office of Management and Budget at the federal uh, level, have proposed changes to the Metropolitan Statistical Area. Um, uh, and we provided comments for the Metropolitan Statistical Area changes uh, some of the changes they proposed are make the MSA a qualifying criteria from 50,000 to 100,000 people. Uh, so this proposed change or increase in population threshold might impact uh, three of the MSAs in uh, Maryland, California, Lexington Park, Cumberland, Maryland, and Salisbury. Those are the three MPOs that might be impacted with this proposed change. So uh, we have submitted the comments and one, some of our concerns are the loss of data which we use to do some analysis. Uh, uh, so we pointed it out in our comments. Uh, and this is more like an FYI. Uh, it's uh, something to be aware of uh, when the federal register guidelines are released after the changes have been at, incorporated, I guess. I would answer questions now or towards the end of, my present, uh, end of this presentation. My contact information is uh, in the slide deck towards the end. Thanks, thanks, Al. Uh, we'll we'll uh, collect all comments we receive and go over them at the end, and and unmute you at that point. So, uh, um, and and so I encourage people if they have any questions for 
uh, to Andrew or Al to submit those. Thanks. Thank you. So the next component of our, uh, again, uh, re the uh, rethinking of the growth model is dealing with the land use map. And Deborah Sward uh, is available to give us an update on the, uh, the land use map. Deborah. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you, Chuck. I'm going to give a quick update on our statewide land use map, um, which is a um, statewide map that shows the general location of um, different densities of residential development, commercial development, industrial, institutional, um, and other developed land uses. Um, and it was last updated in 2010. Um, we initiated a, a 2020 update last year. So um, we held a webinar last year when we kicked off the project um, and many local jurisdictions participated and we did a lot of outreach to talk about some methodology updates that we'll be making. Um, so for one, we're gonna focus solely on developed land uses with this map. So more like residential, commercial and not necessarily distinguishing between um, undeveloped land use types like wetland and water because the Chesapeake Bay program has recently developed a statewide land cover data set that the jurisdictions have been reviewing separately. So rather than reinvent the wheel, we're just gonna to defer to the Bay program for some of that undeveloped land use and land cover. Um, also on the second point, um, we're primarily using prop, um, GIS parcel polygon data with tax assessment data to prepare this map um, so that we can have standardized definitions across the state for the different land uses, but we are, incorporating some local data where possible, where we can match it up with our um, classification system. And we reached out to jurisdictions last year to gather um, any available local data. And finally, we're gonna be incorporating the entire roadway network into the land use map. So instead of just showing um, highways as part of the transportation class, we'll be incorporating the whole roadway. Um, so our next steps, we've been working on a lot of the modeling that goes into general, generating this final land use map. We're gonna be finalizing that spring, this spring in June 2021, um, we're going to be able to access the updated one meter resolution land cover data from the Chesapeake Conservancy that I mentioned previously. Um, and that's a key input to our map and helping identify undeveloped portions of larger parcels. Um, and then once that's done, we're going to start generating final outputs and sending them to local jurisdictions for review um, on a rolling basis. So that's going to be starting probably in late summer 2021. So if your jurisdiction is particularly interested in um, being one of the first jurisdictions to review the map or um, kind of helping us finalize some of our decision-making rules, feel free to um, let me know through a, a chat or um, my contact information is below. So if you have particular interest in reviewing it first or if you have any other questions about the project, I'd be glad to help. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Just since you're there, uh, I'll, I'll, the, we did receive uh, quasi uh, that gave us a question, are, there develop, are you developing land use and land cover at the same time when you, when will each be due? So we're, we're focusing most um, on the developed land uses. So our map will just show like res different densities of residential, commercial, um, and other developed land uses. And then we'll have everything else just be undeveloped. Um, and then we're going to just treat like the land cover as a separate data set because it'll be sourced from the Chesapeake Conservancy. Um, so d does that answer the question? Uh, I think so. We'll, okay. for, it is good for right now. So I, again, thank you very much. And if there's any further questions, uh, please follow up directly with, with Deborah on that. Thanks. Thanks, thank Deborah. You. So again, uh, the the land use map that we just talked about, the census uh, information. Uh, and now the generalized zoning are all components of, of our, our rethinking of the growth model efforts. So at this point, we're going to ask uh, April to give us a update, uh, um, uh, Shelly April, to give us an, uh, an, an update of uh, the generalized zoning. Shelly, how are you? Shelly, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're talking. Shelly needs to unmute. She's self-muted. All right. Uh, sorry. Um, so now can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we are wrapping up the generalized zoning project right now. We had the tables that we sent out to the counties and municipalities for review, the early ones that we sent out in January, February, March. 
uh, we've decided to wrap those counties up and if we've gotten responses, we've reviewed those to make sure we've got everything. Uh, for those that didn't didn't want to review, we've taken the tables as they are and we're going to incorporate those in our data set. So we've got those and then the remainder of the counties, uh, those we should have um, wrapping those up and doing that um, about mid-May. Once we've got all that data together, we're going to um, get our final statewide data set pulled together and uh, that should be available sometime early summer. That initial final product is going to be just the statewide data set um, in a shapefile format or geodatabase format. And it'll include um, just some basic information and the general zoning. And then after we've completed that, we'll be looking at some other type of um, possibilities for the data. We definitely will be including the data in Finder Online and a couple other existing applications. And we'll be looking at other applications that we could possibly create using the data. And then we'll be starting our update for the project again in 2022, sometime probably late spring to collect any changes in the data that would be available. Great, thanks Shelley. Um, and again, if there are any questions about generalized zoning, please feel free to put that in the questions and we'll ask Shelley to answer them after we finish up the update. So at this point, uh, we are going to go um, to one I call what one of those metrics or, or measuring the different uh, uh, combining all the different indicators along the way, which is dealing with our housing element models and guidelines. At this point, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Joe Griffiths to uh, come online and uh, give us an update on the housing element and some other items you may want to share. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, first, I want to thank all the um, uh, communities and jurisdictions and planners that have reviewed the generalized zoning tables that we sent out earlier this year that Shelley was mentioning and providing their feedback and edits to it. Um, we really appreciate um, your communication and, and working with our regional planners. Uh, so I, I just want to briefly touch on the housing element models and guidelines. We are uh, getting close to the end of phase two of the, this product, which we, we um, developed and published last June. So I'm gonna go over some updates and things we're still working on. Uh, first, we added the five-year estimates, ACS five-year estimates from uh, 2015 to 2019. So if you look at that circle at the top, you can toggle between the 2014-18 the five-year estimates and the 2015-2019 um, estimates. Uh, as when you toggle, it will change both the, the charts that display on the bottom of the screen to represent which um, five year it is, uh, but also when you go click on reports uh, in the upper left part of the toolbar, uh, whichever whichever um, five year estimate you have selected at that top drop down will, will you'll be able to export that individual report. Uh, so as these come out over the years, we'll be able to continue adding new ones. Uh, and it will help uh, jurisdictions get a sense of changes over time. Uh, we also added uh, the Department of Housing Community Development's uh, foreclosure and days on market data, the counts you'll see circled at the bottom. These are only available at the county level. So regardless of the geography you select, be it county, place, or um, census tract, it will show the data at the county level for whichever that geography resides in. Um, so if you, again, if you're looking at a census tract, it's gonna show you the county data for that census tract. Uh, also, in our extra layers that you can add, we added uh, the Department of Housing Community Development's foreclosure hotspot layer. Uh, for under construction, the new 2021 AMI data came out earlier this month. Um, currently, if you were to go onto the dashboard, you'll see the calculator, uh, that we, we call the AMI calculator on, on, in the middle of the screen, is still showing the 2020 data. So we're, we're, looking to, uh, we're working on adding the 2020 uh, uh, AMI information. We're also working on adding the compare function, uh, which will allow the user to compare census tracts to census tracts or counties to counties or a census tract to the county that it's in uh, to give you a, a better sense of distinctions between areas. Um, one thing I forgot to add to the slide, but we're also working on is uh, in March of this year, the Department of Housing and Community Development published their uh, Maryland uh, Housing Needs Assessment, and they have provided us with the uh, uh, data down to the census tract level uh, that um, shows uh, affordability needs for both homeowners and renters at the census tract layer. Uh, 
and we're looking we're working um, to add that to our dashboard as well. Uh, and then uh, finally, other updates separate from the dashboard. We are really close to having uh, best practice uh, write-ups uh, posted to the website. We have about eight we're working on right now. We're working with local jurisdictions uh, to get final approvals and make sure we have them correct. Uh, these go every, uh, everywhere, or they include topics such as uh, financial incentives to inclusionary zoning to preserving existing affordable housing. So we hope to have those up uh, soon. And then finally, some of you might be aware of this, but uh, HB 90, which was cross-filed as uh, SB 687, passed during this past session. It adds an assessment of fair housing requirement to housing elements starting in 2023. Uh, our department is working closely with the Department of Housing and Community Development currently to develop more information and guidance on this requirement. But I also encourage you uh, at the local level to um, uh, look into uh, HB 90 and SB 687 uh, to get a better sense of what those requirements will be starting in 2023. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Uh, here's the contact information, uh, and uh, I do want to follow up. I know that uh, Sean uh, Kimberly is on the line, so I'm going to go back since there was one question before, and, and uh, Quasi was asking, is the point location map available to the public? I don't know if you can uh, uh, unmute yourself, Sean, and, and answer that question about the locational map and availability at the point location. Uh, yes, it is. It, it is on our website, and it's called the, uh, the the Quick Viewers, the name of the product, and it is available to the public on our website. And I think I noticed that it had an, like an XY coordinate for the, the information I think you showed, right? Yes, that's right. Great. Uh, thanks very much, and again, uh, I appreciate that information. Uh, we had one other question that I had on my my list of, of ones to ask uh, was uh, uh, regarding uh, for Deb, Deb Sward, um, how can locals submit data prior to the review period? Um, yes, feel free to shoot me an email if there's any ancillary data that you had wanted to contribute to the map and during our QC process, we can um, do our best to incorporate it. Great. Um, um, I guess, if you have right. something now, the sooner the better, it's probably best, but... Um, I think it's oh. possible that the jurisdiction may have already submitted some data too, because we got um, data through a variety of jurisdictions. So um, it may be worth checking with GIS folks as well um, to see if anything has already been submitted. Or if you if you're not sure, if you want to shoot me an email, I can go through and see if your jurisdiction has submitted something already. Understood. Thank you, Deb. Uh, I'm going to at this point. Uh, do some uh, wrap up of, of, of things. Uh, first of all, I want to reiterate what Secretary McCord mentioned that our nominations for the 2021 Maryland Sustainable Growth Awards are now uh, open to accept uh, nominations. Um, please uh, go to the Maryland uh, planning.maryland.gov for more details about it, the application form or brochure. Uh, the deadline is the um, 23rd. So again, uh, thanks so much uh, for your nominations on that. At this point, I want to conclude our uh, our uh, uh, planning director's roundtable. want to have a big thank you to Secretary McCord, Sean Kimberly, Dave Gannett, uh, Meredith Hill, Jessica Shearer, Chrissy fleshman Cronky, uh, Andrew Mengel, um, a Andrew uh, Al Alcindero, Deborah Sward, Shelley April, Joe Griffiths, and John Coleman especially is our communications and tech guru. Uh, and again, all thank you for all that are attended. A complete recording of today's set, uh, webinar will be posted on the planning.maryland.gov website under the PDR, uh, Planning Directors Roundtable uh, webpage. Uh, we'll post all the presentations and the contact information for the speakers. When you exit today's uh, webinar, we'll be asking you to participate in a short evaluation. We'll take a few minutes from we really appreciate it to uh, give us some feedback, ideas on how we can improve the PDR, PDR experience, uh, as well as any webinar suggestions along the way. Keep an eye on the planning.maryland.gov, our, our e-blogs, um, and please feel free to visit smartgrowth.org uh, so you can get information about our upcoming webinars. Um, we want to improve those along the way. 
uh, again, thank you. Uh, sorry for any technical difficulties we might have had, and uh, uh, look forward to your input. Uh, thank you very much, and you guys all have a great day. Thank you. Bye now.